Okay. Welcome everyone um, to Downtown Voices Coalition District 7 uh, Council Candidate Forum. So uh, I am Jeff Sherman. I am the current chair of Downtown Voices Coalition. And um, we have been an organization since about 2004, made up mainly of historic um, advocates, property owners, developers, um, and just neighborhood advocates meet every second Saturday or every yeah second Saturday of every month um, still even through COVID so I would just a like to welcome everyone um, definitely want to first off encourage everyone to vote early voting started today I believe so make sure you're registered hopefully and are going to go and vote um, also remember to remind your friends and family that live in District 3, there is also a race. Um, that race is very important to keeping Phoenix on a positive path as well. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone that knows anyone in District 3 to encourage them to vote. Um, the moderator for this evening will be Mr. Steve Weiss, Executive Director of No Festival Required and actually our first uh, DVC chair. So going through just quickly, there will be nine questions all developed by members of the steering committee. Um, each candidate will have two minutes to answer. Obviously, you don't need to take up the two minutes. Feel free to be brief if you, know, if you can sum up the question or the answer that quickly. We will do two minutes of opening remarks, two minutes of closing remarks. I have also, um, picked two places where I wanna do follow-up questions, one with each candidate. Um, so I will be introducing or breaking in on that. Uh, the moderator knows where those locations are at this point. And um, with that, just a reminder to everyone, keep your mics muted. Um, We're pretty much gonna keep everyone off video unless they are speaking and if there is any interruptions, um, just expect that you will be kicked um, out of the meeting at this point. We just wanna keep everything um, as simple as possible. So with that, I'm going to introduce Mr. Steve Weiss, who will uh, allow the candidates to do their two minute introductions. So Jim, you wanna make sure Steve is unmuted and we will start. Unmute. We are there. unmuted. Yay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask for um, uh, opening statements from uh, the two candidates. I'm going to begin with uh, Yasmin Ansari. Oh. Did I get it switched around? I did get it switched around. Jeff has reminded me, <laughs> and I am going to ask for the opening statements from the two candidates. The first person will be Cynthia Estella. Thank you. There we go. It's the new video. Hey. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Cynthia Stella, and I'm your candidate for Phoenix City Council District 7. It really is a great honor to be here today. Um, I am the candidate that's been in this district going on for 17 years. It really is my great honor to serve my community for this last 17 years. I've been very active in my community. I moved, um, my family actually immigrated when I was very much a very little baby to Arizona. And at 19 years old, I moved into the district when I became a homeowner. I became very active. I am the one that does the barbecue, the turkey trot, the egg hunt, the golfing event, the street cleanups, COVID testing in the morning, helped with our new 202 freeway. In fact, I was on the solar initiative and on different coordinated campaigns. I absolutely love my district with all my heart. I love that I'm able to go out and the moment I leave my doors, I see so many different things that I was part of and creating this change. It really is my honor to be able to 
be part of this beautiful community that's grown so very much. We go from 107th Avenue to 3rd Street and Indian School to Elliott Road. I have two beautiful children that I'm raising in this district, and I, the, which covers Estrella, Maribel, Levine, South Phoenix, and downtown Phoenix. And it truly is my honor to be able to work with my entire community. The three things that I'm really focused on is economic development, infrastructure, and public safety. I've always stayed true to my message and I look forward to start building bridges in my community and being an active member of this beautiful city council and really creating some positive change for our community. So thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. And, and now uh, the opening statement by uh, Yasmin Ansari. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Yasmin Ansari. Um, for those who I'm meeting for the first time tonight, um, I'm an Arizona native, daughter of two immigrants. Um, I uh, graduated from Stanford and Cambridge universities where I studied international relations and public policy. Um, and I've spent most of my career working on issues like air pollution and climate change and public health. Um, most recently served as a senior advisor at the United Nations. I also spent some time working with former governor Jerry Brown. Um, but most importantly, I'm a very, very proud downtown and District 7 resident. Um, my campaign um, has a number of priorities, but I would say our top five priorities and issues that I hope to work on when elected include, first and foremost, ensuring that uh, Phoenix uh, is safely recovers from the pandemic, from supporting small businesses to providing rent and utility relief to families. There's a lot to do to make sure that families can come out of this safely. Number two, I'd like to work on addressing our affordable housing and homelessness crisis. Number three, you know, with Phoenix being on the front lines of the climate crisis, I'm incredibly passionate about combating air pollution and cleaning up our air and water. Number four, promoting public safety. And number five, which is an issue especially relevant to downtown, um, helping lead the economic revitalization of downtown. When elected, I will continue to meet with neighbors, be accessible, um, throughout the campaign, I'm so proud to share that uh, my field team, volunteers, and myself have collectively knocked on over 100,000 doors and about 40,000 doors of those since January of this year. Um, so we're running a really, really strong ground game. Um, we've also seen an outpouring of support since Election Day. Um, have about 50 elected leaders and organizations that are supporting our campaign. Um, including Mayor Kate Gallego, Congressman Greg Stanton, the Urban Phoenix Project, and the Phoenix Firefighters and Paramedics. As your councilwoman, uh, this will be my full-time job, which, as we all know, is a stark contrast from the leadership that we've had over the past 12 years. Um, when I commit to something, you know, I work around the clock. I'm very dedicated, committed, and I'm really, really excited about bringing new energy, commitment, and experience to this position. Um, and working with you all really to make downtown and District 7 the best possible place it can be. So thank you again for this opportunity and um, I hope to work with all of you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start the questions um, and actually the first question will go to uh, Yasmin um, and the question is in regards to community. As a leader, what is your assessment of obtaining community buy-in or acceptance to help meet your vision for a successful downtown? What value do you see in community involvement in the revitalization of downtown? Thank you so much for the question. Um, honestly, I see obtaining community buy-in as absolutely essential to everything that I do as an elected official. Participatory government is a, is a core value of mine. And that's why you know, throughout the campaign knocking on so many doors, one of the conclusions that I've come to is that it's really important that we continue the organizing work beyond just this election, continue to knock on doors in the district to make sure people know, you know, about the resources that the city offers about, you know, community town halls and forums that we want to have and about all of the issues that really affect people's lives on a daily basis. Um, so as another, you know, as councilwoman, one of the other um, things that I hope to do is set up mobile offices throughout the district, you know, this is a massive district spanning from downtown to South Phoenix, Maryville, Estrella, Levine. Um, so setting up mobile offices and really bringing City Hall to the people is something that I'm excited about looking into. Um, and here in downtown, you know, we obviously have an exceptionally high level of engagement from residents. Everyone, for the most part, is really engaged, involved, and excited about contributing. So 
I want to keep that spirit alive and well, and also encourage more of that from our neighbors throughout the community um, and make sure that people are directly involved in the revitalization of downtown. Um, and I, I can assure you that throughout my tenor, tenure, I will always, always turn to you, you know, as community members, many of you have been here for many years and before I was born, probably no offense. And I look forward to receiving your thoughts and suggestions um, on how we can make downtown the best possible place for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, what I've been told is that Jeff will have follow-up questions for both candidates. Uh, for this particular uh, question, uh, Jeff would like to ask a follow-up to Yasmin. Thank you, Steve. So uh, quick question, Yasmin, you get yours right up front. Um, like many, many other DVC members, uh, your opponent currently sits on one of the city's village planning committees. These committees can be a great way to understand the community's support and opposition of many local items. Can you highlight a similar community listening role that you've had in your past? Look, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, having worked at the United Nations, you know, on one of the most difficult issues of our time, climate change, I would say that I was, I've constantly been in a listening role. You know, I've been in positions where, um, not myself directly, but I've, you know, been working with, you know, high level officials where we're meeting with heads of oil and gas companies, heads of, you know, coal companies, financial management, um, folks who are heavily invested in oil and gas. And it's very much a listening role to hear different sides of people's perspectives and to come, you know, come to a middle ground agreement. Um, so very much used to talking to folks, you know, from all sides of the aisle and very different perspectives in terms of larger feedback, you know, similarly, again, at the UN, everything is as inclusive as possible. So every, you know, worked on multiple global climate summits where input from national governments, you know, is critical. So I've, spoke, I've worked with, you know, folks from all different nationalities soliciting input to really come to a conclusion. And the Paris Agreement is the number one example of that, right? So having to work with national governments um, from the Middle East to South America to Europe, um, to make sure that we bring all parties to the table to come to a consensus around a global accord. So I'm excited to bring that experience to the table here in Phoenix, where I think it's very similar. You know, you're always having to work with people with di very different perspectives, gathering input and making some progress. And I'm someone who believes that some progress is always better than no progress at all. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go back now to the same question and uh, ask Cynthia for a response. Um, would you like me to go back through the question again, Cynthia? She is there. I will go back through the question and read it one more time. As a leader, what is your assessment of obtaining community buy-in or acceptance to help meet your vision for a successful downtown? What value do you see in community involvement in the revitalization of downtown? This is the core of what it what it's meant to me for the last 17 years of my life. The last 17 years of my life has been hearing my community and it's being active in the change. And it doesn't matter if it's Estrella, Maribel, Levine, South Phoenix or downtown Phoenix. It's important as a community leader to understand our community and their needs. I personally knocked over 15,000 doors. And before this campaign, I've knocked on the doors for different reasons, for to a help elect an individual or for an initiative. Hearing my community and the community leaders and these wonderful groups that our community has put together is essential. One shouldn't make any moves because we're not an expert when it comes to any of those things. You guys are. I believe that there are certain experts even on certain streets when I knock because street by street, their issues can be completely different. And this is one of the focal points, why I am part of the village, why I'm the vice president of the, our community council of LULAC, um, a boy scout mother, girl scout mother. It's, it's really important that we listen to our community and have their input. An open door policy will always be my policy. My, I will be available as much as possible to co my community and I will be a full-time councilwoman. And so it's important for me to be active in my community, I will never, one of my personal goals is to finish knocking my entire district at some point. 
And if anybody knows, and I know some of these, some of the people that are here know me and they know that's to be true. I need to hear all my community and there is no barrier when it comes to me. Porque yo hablo español. And I am part of District 7 because I am District 7. So thank you so much for that question. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question will go to Cynthia and it is on communications. While downtown groups tend to have many professional experts on their boards, this limits community input to the few individuals who will push back or correct staff on technical issues. Should the city help to build a community's technical knowledge, even if that knowledge is used to challenge the city's preferred outcome? And how can you help to build that knowledge? I look forward to being challenged. I want people to challenge what I'm saying because that's the only way we're going to grow together as a collaborative group. So this is really important to me. As your next councilwoman, I look forward to having many town halls. I personally want to talk to all different parts of my district. And like I said, I'm not going to need a translator. Yo voy a poder hablar con mi gente directly. And that's really important. The community needs to feel that trust in their leader. And I will do that. I will make sure that my office does that as well, that we have many different town halls, coffees, um, different meetings, and to be able to support those community members that don't have the same access as many of us that are very active in our community because we, we're able to. Many of my constituents work two to three jobs. So when changes do happen, it saddens me when they don't have a voice or when they don't have an opinion, an input. This is a really big, a big problem to me. And that's why I think it's so essential as the next councilwoman to make sure that I'm as active as possible, just like I have been for the last 17 years within my district. I have been a very active member and this truly showed in November. And so that's what's really important to me is to make sure that I'm reaching my community, that I understand their needs. And even if I'm not their choice now, when it comes to March and I am their council member, I wanna make sure that they know that all those things are behind us. And I want them to call me. I want to listen to them. I want to understand their needs and I want to support them. And that's going to be a, one of the most important priorities to me because all my constituents are going to, are my priority. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Yasmin, would you respond to the question as well? Absolutely. Um, I think related to what I said in the last answer, I believe that the more um, opinions and perspectives we're able to solicit on any issue, the better. Um, while our boards obviously play a very vital role in shaping and pressure testing policy in our city, I think our citizens deserve a say that goes far beyond any of these boards. Um, so as a councilwoman, I think, you know, I very much hope to work with city staff and other technical experts to help kind of foster that technical expert expertise within um, our, you know, within the constituents of the district. As you mentioned, you know, again, as someone who's worked on a very technical issue, I am, but, you know, something that is important to everyone, I understand the need to build that foundational literacy. So whether that means hosting town halls around very specific technical issues, hosting workshops, um, to, pro to provide a bit more of the granular detail around things. I think that's something that I'm very excited to do because we really can't expect, you know, everyone beyond their busy jobs and, and lifestyles to have these sorts of technical expertise. Even having been running for a year and a half for this position, there's so many technical <laughs> aspects of the city and policies and how things are developed that I'm still understanding and I'm sure we'll continue to learn um, after elected. I also think that we just have such an amazing array of professionals downtown, you know, whether from architects or union workers to bus operators, financial analysts, um, our collective talent is unlimited. So I really hope that we can work toward, together towards um, holding our city elected officials, including myself, accountable. I think accountability is the most important thing. And I hope we get more people involved in the process to then keep us accountable as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question will go to Yasmin, uh, and it's in regards to aesthetics. Downtown should be a regional leader in best design practices, while also incorporating heritage, community assets, and sustainability into all of our plans and codes. To achieve these goals, 
how would you encourage the city to review and update the downtown strategic vision, downtown code, and urban form project? Will you encourage the permanent implement implementation of the complete streets guidelines? And how would you incorporate sustainability and innovation into the update? Absolutely. Um, I'm personally very excited. I think this is one of the pieces that I'm most excited about um, to work on revisions to the downtown strategic vision, the downtown code and the urban form project. I think when it comes to the downtown strategic vision in particular, you know, it's an incredible piece of work, but when it was first conceived, you know, we didn't necessarily anticipate the housing boom that we've seen in Phoenix, or we didn't anticipate the affordable housing crisis that we also have. So it's definitely in need of a refresh. Um, I think that, you know, I'm willing to jump in and, and be a leader alongside all of you. Um, and when it comes to revising that, you know, my top priorities will be along the lines of what you mentioned, more affordability, that's absolutely essential, including a mix of housing more sustainability. Um, we can, I know we're going to talk more about sustainability later on in the forum, but um, that's, you know, a huge priority of mine, more shade, and most importantly, more jobs. Um, and regarding implementation, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you enough, you know, on everything from complete streets to shade to homelessness. The city is filled with studies and policies that have never been implemented. Um, so, the lack of complete streets to me is particularly frustrating as somebody who, you know, is very much supportive of a, of a thriving downtown corridor. Um, there is better complete streets implementation going on in the suburbs, you know, than there is going on in the heart of our city. And that's definitely a disappointment to see. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I think when it comes to how to implement these things, I think it's about, you know, being in there full time, being somebody who is a fighter and somebody who knows how to work in bureaucracies, which is, Something that I've dealt with, you know, for the past six, seven years of my career professionally is dealing with one of, you know, the largest bureaucracy. So I'm excited to get to work on these things. And, you know, downtown um, as a resident is very near and dear to my heart. So looking forward to working with all of you on all of these projects. Thank you. Uh, and now, Cynthia, your response? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> We definitely need some updating. We need some more input from our new residents. You know, we have so many new residents that are come to downtown Phoenix. I mean, that really are energetic and have a lot to bring to the table. And we need to make sure that we listen to them as well. And we know many of us, many of us here right now are new residents of the city of Phoenix and to downtown Phoenix. And I'm sure you want to bring an input to the downtown code. I really am a big component though of not forgetting the old because we're moving to the 21st century. We need to make sure that we preserve the great things that we already have going and, and making sure we take care of those things like our water lines are 103 years old, making sure that whatever city owned, we make sure that we update them. Um, I'm, I'm big on historic preservation as well. We need to make sure that we preserve that history. Just like when you walk down in Chicago and New York and you can see the new mixed with the old, but it didn't affect and preserve our history. We have such beautiful history in downtown Phoenix and that's really important that we continue to preserve it and also hear all our voices. Um, I really do look forward to working with such amazing groups like yourself and I want to have complete streets. I want to make sure that we have this continued bike path. I mean, right now, currently, downtown Phoenix doesn't have a continuous bike path. And that's that shouldn't be this way. So I will be a big advocate when it comes to, to those type of things. Make sure that we have shading, that we can provide more jobs, more workforce housing, affordable housing. Take care of our community. Take, take care of our people that are experiencing homelessness and really working together as a collaborative group. I look forward to doing this. I'm an expert when it comes to that. And I, I'm very excited. So thank you for this question. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question will first go uh, to Cynthia and it is in regards to preservation. Uh, Proposition 207 passed in 2006 by Arizona voters requires government entities to reimburse property owners when regulations result in a decrease in the property's value and prevents the government from exercising eminent domain on behalf of a private party. Unfortunately, local government officials and legal departments have shied away from normal zoning and land use regulations that might, real or perceived, impact property values. 
property owners of individual historic buildings, especially in residential historic districts, have sometimes threatened Proposition 207 lawsuits, despite the fact that studies show that restored historic buildings and districts raise property values. The question, would you support a review by the city's Historic Preservation Office and legal department of the impact of Proposition 207 with recommendations to respect the measure's intent, but minimize its damaging effects? Well, I would. While I respect private property, it's really important that, like, I'm a community member, and it's important that we listen to our community as well. So, you know, I, I hear this, I actually heard this while walking downtown is, for instance, someone wanted to bring a bar, zoning would have allowed it in the community, but how would it affect the community? And that's really what we have to understand. Um, that's a big issue. We can't just go in there again, bring the old with the new and work together. We don't want to affect people's property and their private property, but we definitely need to see how it's going to affect the community members and what project or what business were to come into the community, how it's going to affect and what's the ripple effects of that business that would be coming in. So again, it, situations may vary from, again, from different areas within down, downtown Phoenix, but um, more than anything, I, will, I would be respectful of, you know, the community and whatever project that we would have lying before us. Thank you very much. Uh, Yasmin, can you respond to the same question now, please? Sure. Um, let me start by saying that I obviously support historic preservation. Um, as a downtown resident, some of my favorite places to walk around includes the, include those parts of the city that really reflect our storied past and our character. Heritage Square, for instance, is a prime example of our ability to both preserve our his city's history while also creating multifunctional spaces. Um, with your question specifically regarding a review, I would certainly support this. Unfortunately, um, there are no state statutes providing guidance on Prop 207 and very little Arizona court precedent to refer to. Um, but we do have study after study after study that does show that historic preservation actually raises property values. It does not diminish them. Um, so we need to start building positive precedents that can strengthen our historic preservation programs. Um, I I would also be excited and, and look forward to look working with um, historic, working with community members who are on this call to find additional tools for our toolbox of how we can further um, further understand what tools we can have, including additional uh, grant funding for historic preservation. So I think there's other things out there that we can do, and um, I look forward to working with um, some of the folks on this call uh, to, to identify those. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and now the question. We'll first go to Yasmin uh, in regards to mobility and accessibility. In the last few years, we have seen the city scrape, uh, scrap <laughs> several high profile light rail, bicycle and pedestrian projects. Most recently along East Van Buren Street, despite years of community engagement, public feedback and federal grants attached. Oftentimes these approved plans are complex and rely on multiple agencies to act over a long time. How will you propose we limit the city from reactionary short-term decision-making or long-term transportation goals and initiatives? Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate the question because I think you've hit on something that, like you said, keeps happening over and over again, and it's just simply unacceptable. I think that it's imperative that the city maintain strong, continuous dialogue with residents and the broader community throughout the decision-making process. For City Hall to operate in a vacuum is clearly unacceptable. And I'll lead the charge to ensure that we solicit and respect citizen input through every stage of the process. If the city for some reason has valid reasons for moving in another direction, I think it's essential that those reasons be communicated with the public um, in a very transparent and accessible way and that the city con considers counter arguments. Um, so I think, you know, overall, that will be my approach. Again, cutting through the bu bureaucracy, making sure there's effective communication 
from the beginning of a process to the end of a process. And it, when, when it comes to public transit specifically, I mean, I will be an even more passionate advocate as this, is, this issue is at the core of my campaign. Public transit is essential to a thriving urban core. We all know that. Um, so when it comes to anything about advocating for the light rail, for safety, for our bicyclists and pedestrians, for more trees and shade, um, you can really count on me to be right by your side, pushing for these policies to make downtown and frankly, the, the entire district um, is, in, is in serious need of all of these things, the best that it can possibly be. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Cynthia, for your answer to the same question. Yeah, I would have a very difficult time postponing any project that was already in line. Uh, this is why I'm looking for different avenues to making sure that the money that is generated in downtown Phoenix stays in downtown Phoenix. Those parking meters are essential. That are the streets of downtown Phoenix are the ones that are getting beat up. So why is it that it's going to the general fund instead of a fund that goes directly to downtown Phoenix? And that would also stop from any project from being postponed or delayed. I will be a big advocate always to work with my community. As a community member for so many years, this is the only way I know how to be, is to be involved within my community and hands on with those type of things. I think it's essential that we start really moving forward to getting all those funds that do go, go come from those parking meters go directly to more bike lanes, more accessibility, uh, more tree shades, but the right type of, sh of trees and especially more affordable housing. We need to make sure that we can, you know, finance that that fund for our housing as much as possible and for it to go right back to the city of Phoenix. Mobility is important. Everybody's moving to this urban core and a lot of them aren't coming with, with cars. We need to make sure that we invest in those e-scooters, that we have more, the continuous bike lanes that I continue to say, because it is important. I mean, this, that's important to the community of downtown. And I wanna make sure that they feel safe when on, they're on those bikes. So that's essential to me, it really is. And we need to make sure that we have shade. So I will be a champion when it comes to those type of issues. And even though the district is quite large, they're just like my children. Well, all my two children, but my district is five. And they all have their own needs and they all gain their own funds. And we need to make sure that it stays within that district. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. And uh, to stay with you, Cynthia, for the next question. Uh, the question is on diversity. Uh, what background experience do you bring to the city council that will ensure that the value of inclusion, equal access to opportunity and diversity are at the forefront of your decisions? How do you propose to leverage investment dollars, services and protections to ensure that our diverse community has a rate of range of choices for living affordably in and around downtown. Well, I am a mother. I'm a, I'm a mother. I'm an immigrant. I'm an active community member. It's those are some of the things you hablo español también, and that's important. Our community deserves to have a voice. Diversity. That's our district. I mean. Let me tell you, downtown Phoenix is definitely not like Estrella and Levine is not like Maryville and South Phoenix is not like any other party really either. You know, they have a little mixture of Maryville too. And so I really believe that we need to understand needs, those, those direct needs of each part of my district and to be able to bring that affordable housing. How are we going to do that? Well, the city of Phoenix owns a lot of land. And I've worked with my community as far as me serving on that village has helped me understand so much when it, when it comes to development. So this is going to be essential for me. I'm going to work with the development community, private and private sectors, in order to bring that affordability. How are we going to do that? These giplets. As long as it don't affect community or schools, we need to make sure that we make it more enticing able to bring more affordability, more affordable housing. So that it also brings us another 10% additional affordable housing when we offer that to a development. We also need to make sure that we 
we sell that property or we work with that private and public sector and provide that property at a lower cost. So it ultimately goes to the renter or to the person that's going to occupy them. We have to make sure that we build these homes for the people that work at Chase Field that at our convention center, that work at the hotels. We need to make more workable, walkable, livable in downtown Phoenix, just like everybody else. This needs to become a complete community. And again, it doesn't matter if it's downtown Phoenix, South Phoenix, Levine, Maribel, or Estrella, we need to keep that in mind. Everybody deserves a place to live. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. And uh, now, Yasmin. Thank you. Um, well, I think there are both, you know, personal and professional elements to this question. Um, I'm the daughter of two immigrants who came from the Middle East in the late 1970s, grew up in the 9-11 era, so very much understand um, and have endured my fair share of, of racism and hurtful comments. So when it comes to my form of representation, though, I very much hope that I, you know, um, that everyone in my district, no matter their background, feels welcomed, included, and represented. And obviously this begins first and foremost with my staff, and I have committed several times over and continue to commit to having a diverse staff um, in my office who will be able to consider all points of view um, before making a decision. Um, when it comes to housing issues and how we should use our investment dollars, look, I think affordable housing and the housing crisis in Phoenix right now is top of mind for everybody. And, and that's completely fair. We're about 160,000 units short of affordable housing in the city of Phoenix. In District 7, residents are paying 46% of their income on rent. And this is absolutely unacceptable. So in terms of my proposed policies, and you know, I think there's a couple of things. First and foremost, we just need more housing overall. Like we need diversity of housing, whether that's duplexes, fourplexes, apartment complexes, you know, we need more housing to help keep that cost low. We also need to make sure that the city's plan that was just passed last year on affordable housing and homelessness, we actually need to deliver on this plan. Speaking of plans that have not been delivered on, you know, earlier in the segment, um, 50,000 units have been promised in terms of affordable housing over the next decade. We actually need to make sure that this is delivered upon in the community. And then we need all, we also thirdly need more permanent housing for our unsheltered folks um, and less red tape, less bureaucracy to get people housed um, in a more permanent way. So, you know, this, that's why this is one of the main issues of my campaign, because I really think that every single person in the city of Phoenix, of course, deserves a roof over their head. This is a necessity, not a luxury. So, I will be working on this actively. I'm excited to work with the mayor and the other council members that have endorsed me to make sure that this happens. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this question will go to you again, to, uh, to Yasmin. Um, and it's in regards to arts and culture and specifically within the district. Uh, Grand Avenue was home to a weekly low rider cruise for several months before some merchants complained of its impact on their businesses and public right of way and a general discontentment with the lack of coordination, permitting, and event infrastructure, which included trash receptacles and bathrooms. The event is not now happening, but discussions have been raised with the mayor and council members about creating a situation where a limited return of the cruise takes place. What is your opinion on this event in your district? And what would you do as a council member to find a solution that would make both lowriders, merchants, and neighbors happy. Well, I will say that this is a very, very difficult compromise to come to, but I do think that it's possible. Um, I'm certainly welcome to facilitating a conversation between lowriders and merchants and neighbors to find a way to bring back a version of the weekly cruise that works for everyone. I have had some, uh, some conversations, I will admit, in a limited capacity so far with business owners along Grand Avenue and community members who are, of course, very opposed to it. Um, while respecting the culture. And I've also had conversations with the low rider community. So certainly understand both sides. Um, but ultimately here, my approach would be the same approach that I will have on every issue, which is, I think it's imperative to bring everyone to the table um, to have a conversation with the aim of finding a solution. I think there's certainly cultural value um, and you know the unique aspect of the low rider events, um, but I also you know feel for the businesses um, that say this has gotten out of hand. So I think, 
think just building on the work that's already been done, bringing folks to the table and trying to come up with a solution. I know alternative locations are being looked at, for example, of hosting this event. So there's already progress underway here. Um, and I hope to build upon that after I'm elected. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, Cynthia, your response to the question. There we go. So, you know, first Friday wasn't welcomed right away either. And I think, again, it's really the community really talking together and as a collaborative group. I also believe that every major city has their own culture and needs. And we need to make sure that we keep that alive, especially during this pandemic. It's more of an emotional place now that this um, event why it's so important, it's to, it's to bringing the community together. I've actually been out there many times with my children and I've walked it. I have provided trash cans, boxes and picked up the trash afterwards to make sure that I alleviated some of the problem. Even uh, with some of my great friends that live down there like Jessica Bueno and picked up trash with her because she showed me. I, I heard about it right away and I met with a couple of groups already and listened to the community and tried to support the businesses as well. Um, I believe that we need to somehow come up with a compromise and see how we can, you know, it doesn't have to be like a weekly thing, but definitely keep that culture alive and work with the business owners and really provide certain uh, limitations or rules or how we can all benefit from such a great event as a community. And that's really important to me. We need to make sure that we come up with a compromise that works for all. I know it's not going to be easy because some people are very stronghold about this, but I believe that with community involvement and engagement, especially from your local leaders, that's where changes for the positive happen. And this is the time to do it. Make sure we need to keep that culture alive, especially during this pandemic. We, we look forward to these type of things. These are the things that we can do while this pandemic that's still safe because it's still very much social distancing. And even after hopefully this pandemic's over, people enjoy their time. They invest a lot of money in their cars and we need to also be supportive to the neighbors and to the businesses there. We need to make sure that we keep our culture alive and our community involved. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, direct the next question to you, Cynthia. Uh, and it's in regards to economic development. Love it. As a council member, you will be asked to vote to approve government property lease excise taxes or GPLET which the city has relied on as an economic tool to make downtown projects more attractive to developers, even during this market upcycle. Development projects are required to provide a benefit to the community, equivalent to the savings. What would you consider to be a tangible and measurable community benefit necessary for your vote to support such projects? And then, I'm going to add the last part, which is please use a $20 million eight year abatement as an example and share how your community benefit would need to be allocated and measured to gain your vote in favor. And please note the taxpayers in the local school district do pay extra to make up for the loss tax value of the vacant land. Thank you. Well, in order for me to be okay with giving out a Jeep Jeeplet, I believe that it's all about affordable housing. We're going through a housing crisis right now. And if we're going to offer it to a development or a developer or a private and public sector partnership, we need to make sure that it's going to help and benefit our ultimate goal. And our ultimate goal here is to make sure that we get more affordable housing, more workforce housing. So that would be the only way is for them to have that understanding that the project that they're going to build, not only because they have to do a 10% more increase affordable housing, but their ultimate goal of that plan is to build more workforce housing, that the community is going to accept it and going to be proud of it, take pride in that project. Of course, I would never want as a mother 
And as a mother of two children that go to public school in the district, it's important for me to make sure that it doesn't affect our schools. We can't let that affect our schools and we need to make sure that that development or that developer makes sure that they pay those taxes in those eight years of um, that they would have that tax break. So that would be the only way that I would be in favor of those things. I know that there's many different projects that have asked for it and some of them I've completely not agreed with, but the ones that know that there we're having a, a crisis, a house crisis, I'm more than excited to because they're the ones that are, you know, being a leader in this and they're looking forward to developing more workforce housing. So as long as that our schools and our community aren't affected, that's when I will be a champion and offering it to them as well. Thank you very much. And now um, your response to the question, uh, Yasmin. Thank you. Uh, well, it's very clear that there's at least a couple people on this call who know much more about giplets than I do. So I definitely won't pretend to be an expert. Um, but what I can share with you is the principles that I will work on when evaluating and making decisions on these. First, obviously, tax dollars are valuable and shouldn't be surrendered or given away without a clear cost benefit justification. Um, and second, when you talk about community benefit, we should be talking about the people who already are living and working and creating the vibrant downtown that we all have. We all know giplets are overwhelmingly concentrated in the downtown area. So it's groups like yours that I will rely on when evaluating the prospects of giplets in District 7. Um, I, I think in terms of the principles, you know, absolutely. I think the current council, the mayor, the uh, several other council members are really already looking at community benefits like affordability, sustainability, good jobs, housing uh, when it comes to giplets. So I look forward to working with them. I think when it comes to the specific question about how funds should be spent or you know what those principles should be you know housing and homelessness support is you know top of mind city amenities and how we can contribute to the revitalization of downtown and whether that's park um, improved infrastructure like repaved roads light rail etc and arts and culture programs as well but again, I think I do see the you know economic incentive of giplets, but I think the clear public benefit piece has just been overlooked uh, for too long. And it's really important for whoever is elected here in District 7 to take that seriously and really value the community's input and make sure giplets are actually benefiting the community and not just the developers um, who are proposing the projects. Thank you. The next question will go to you, Yasmin, uh, and it's in regards to environment. Uh, District 7 encompasses an incredibly diverse range from urban areas, suburban developments, sprawling house properties and farms. It also includes a very diverse economic strata. What environmental issues do you see as most pressing for downtown and what issues do you see affecting the overall district and population. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, you're right, the diversity of District 7 is what makes it so special. You'd be hard pressed, I think, to find another district in the city of Phoenix with such a range in landscapes. Um, unfortunately, our district is also the hardest hit when it comes to environmental issues. I've said over and over again, and there's no you know, question at this point that Phoenix is on the front lines of the, of the climate crisis. And District 7 bears the brunt of this. When we talk about air pollution in the city of Phoenix, we now have some of the worst air pollution in the entire United States. I mean, that's outrageous. We're almost as bad as LA at this point. South Phoenix and West Phoenix feel the concentration of this. Um, and that air quality is affecting the health of our residents. So this is why this has been such a cornerstone of my platform. You know, Folks like to say that climate is a national or international issue, but really it's a public health issue affecting us every single day. This is why at City Hall, you know, my number one of my big priorities will be to combat air pollution. I'll crack down on corporate polluters in West and South Phoenix. Um, I am very excited to come in at the perfect time when it comes to Phoenix's revamping of its climate action plan. Um, Mayor Gallego recently joined something called the C40, which is a coalition of mayors all around the world dedicated to combating climate change. And so we're revising our climate action plan. So when it comes to you know, making sure that plan is as bold as possible and really addresses some of these inequities that exist within the city, I'm excited to do that. 
Um, I will push for expanding um, and transitioning our own bus fleet to be 100% electric. One of my personal passion projects will be to work on making electric vehicles more affordable and accessible to working families. Um, and then of course, supporting the city of Phoenix's tree and shade master plan. I mean, trees are truly one of the best solutions when it comes to our, you know, protecting ourselves from heat, protecting ourselves in the summertime to capturing some of the pollution in the air. So I'm excited to work on that, investing in clean and renewable energy. I mean, this is my expertise, it's my passion, and I really wanna make sure that District 7 um, is a healthy place for everybody to live. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Cynthia, uh, your response to the question. So we're the Valley of the Sun. And a couple of years ago, they tried to take our solar panels, just like they did to Vegas. This is important to me. And so I was in the forefront of that initiative. And we made sure that we kept those solar panels. We have this beautiful sun that in about an hour and a half, it can create enough electricity to last us for a year and a half. And so we need to make sure that we take advantage of what's already provided to us. We need to make sure that we really go out there throughout the district and push that as much as possible. And as well as push the electric and transportation. Transportation is so important as well. We need to make sure that we continue with more bus, bus routes. Um, make sure that we invest more in our bike lanes. People, feel more comfortable in order of, a lot of people, in, especially in town, they want that walkability, rideability. And we need to make sure that we focus on those things. We need to focus on bringing more trees. That's why, again, I'm. it's important that those meters that are in downtown, that we invest back in downtown Phoenix. This is, this is very important to me as well. And really throughout my district, one part of the district shouldn't benefit from environmental change or solar panels more than the other. And one district shouldn't have more bike paths more than the other. This is one district. And this district is going to have this one councilwoman that will make sure that I will advocate for it to be fair throughout the district. And we can make it more rideable, more walkable, but not just in downtown, but throughout. And that's why it was so important to me that our solar panels weren't taken away. And that's why I was right here in Arizona, in our district, fighting for us. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Cynthia, uh, Jeff has a follow-up question for you and he will give it now. Thank you, Steve. Um, so last question, Cynthia, on this climate change, uh, particularly rising temperatures and water scarcity are probably the biggest threats long-term to Phoenix. Your opponent clearly has a professional advantage on some climate change issues. Can you please highlight any of your own experience on climate change and environmental protection? Yes, uh, the solar panel, the solar initiative. I was actually the only office that was open seven days a week from morning to close. And this was optional. This wasn't something that was forced on us. I was a regional, so I was able to do whatever I wanted. I was also the one that would make sure that we would be able to talk to our state representatives and our state senators. So I would be a big advocate. I didn't just you know, hang around in the office. I was actually in the Capitol, making sure that we had our troops to and stand in the Senate balcony so they can see us, so they, so they can know that we're here and that we care about it. We need to make sure that we take care of our environment. We need to make sure that we take advantage of our beautiful sun that we have so many, so much parts of the year, even right now when it's supposed to be winter and yet in the, in, in the afternoon, we're all taking off our jackets and still wearing our tank tops. This is the time to take advantage of those things and education. I'm not an expert in environment, but I am an expert on listening to my community and knowing what they want. And I will make sure that I get educated as much as possible because I will be a full-time councilwoman. I will make sure that if I need to get, and I will get more educated when it comes to this, and that I will be a champion. I wanna make sure that I provide clean air, get more trees, more walkability, more sustainability for our community and to clean up our air as much as possible. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Um, I am now going to ask uh, for the closing statements um, from the two candidates, beginning um, first with Cynthia Estella. Well, 
I truly look forward to March. I am so very excited. I've actually filed for this seat 7717. And I've been working for it, I believe, my entire life because I've given it everything I've ever had. I've always tried to excel in everything that I've ever worked on with my community because truly the love and passion that I have. I know that I can be a strong voice. I know that I can bring people from different walks of life together to work together as a team. It really is my honor to be of service and I am doing it with every ounce of passion in my heart. I want to be able to serve them and I want to make a difference. I want to make sure that we have great economic development. There is a lot of things to do in District 7. From Estrella, we need to make sure we repave that 99th and 90, 91st Avenue, Buckeye and Broadway Road, extend them, bring more grocery stores and gas stations. Make sure that they get their grocery stores. I mean, come on. It takes 45 minutes for these people to get home, especially if they work in beautiful downtown Phoenix and get to enjoy it. It's taking so long. I know we're doing progress with our beautiful 202 freeway. Make sure that downtown Phoenix and support Hans master plan. We need to make sure that we have our destination point. Make sure that Maryville gets the help that they want with those streets. I mean, there is so many street studies that need to happen in Maryville. We need to make sure that we support them. South Phoenix, we need to make sure that we start getting these sidewalks. We're looking at so many great things moving forward and moving to the 21st century and solar panels. But how about South Phoenix and having sidewalks? That's not fair. We need to make sure that we grow all together and we represent every part of this district. I'm going to be very active. There is not going to be any blockage. I will always be here. I'll be able to communicate with all my district, just like I have been for the last 17 years. And I look forward to raising my kids and making them just as active as I am. They're majors now, so I'm looking forward for them to come to these community groups, talk to our community, and being part of this change. And thank you to all of you that make a difference every day in our community. Thank you for being such great community leaders. Thank you for making your voices be heard. It is my great honor to be your next councilwoman for District 7 coming in March. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Yasmin uh, Ansari, your closing statement. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you so much to everyone who took time out of their evening to be here tonight. Um, I think it's safe to say that District 7 has been left behind for far too long, and it's far past time for new representation, someone with experience and a commitment to making sure that every part of the district is attended to. I'm thrilled to work with you all to ensure that Phoenix remains and continues to become a world-class city for years to come. When elected, as I said, this will be my full-time job, working with the residents of District 7 and making sure that they get the resources they need will, I'm not afraid to work around the clock. I think when you look at my experience, when you look at what I've worked on, even since I was growing up here in Phoenix, working with immigrant and refugee communities, working with the Arizona Democratic Party through my work on climate change at the United Nations, I always deliver on what I set out to do. And that's exactly what I will do when elected to the Phoenix City Council. Running for office has been quite the experience, um, but it's been phenomenal, you know, connecting personally with tens of thousands of District 7 residents. I, you know, these conversations are what really have helped to shape our platform and, and what I hope to do if elected. That's where the mobile office came about, you know, this, this recognition that most people don't even know who their current city council person is. And the fact that they have someone that they can go to, and that's something that we need to change. I really wanna bring back trust in the process. And when it comes to the downtown community, really be a voice for downtown. And so make sure that our downtown neighbors know you have a representative in me that you can call, you can talk to and be assured that I will be there for you. While I have the chance, I do want to invite you all. Um, we are having a large GOTV event. As everyone knows, ballots were mailed out today. So this Saturday, inviting you all to Hans Park, um, 10 a.m. Mayor Gallego will be there as well as a bunch of other special guests. And we you know, have over 100 volunteers coming to knock the entire district for GOTV. So I hope you all can make it. And again, thank you for this opportunity. I would be truly honored to earn your support. Um, and I hope that you will get in touch with me if you have any further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I you know, personally want to thank both of the candidates for, for 
doing this today. I want to also hand it back over uh, to our chair, uh, Jeff, to close uh, the event. Thank you, Steve. Um, sincerely want to thank both candidates. Um, your commitment to Phoenix is you know, showing through all the statements you've made, and I know both of you are very committed to this city, so very much appreciate you showing up. Um, thank you to the steering committee that helped make this happen. And then thank you to all the guests um, for joining us tonight. So with that, I think we are done. And I appreciate everyone. Have a good night. Bye.